Good afternoon, good evening, good morning. My name is Elizabeth Bro. I'm a resident fellow at the American Enterprise Institute. And uh, I'm incredibly thrilled to be hosting and moderating our discussion today about uh, maritime gray zone threats. Now, uh, during this lockdown, uh, the, the most uh, amusing thing has happened, which is that something called sea shanties has gone viral. And, and I don't know how many people, uh, how many of you have ever sung sea shanties, but that's what sailors used to do. And I, who knows, maybe they still do. And all of a sudden, sea shanties have gone viral on TikTok in particular, but on, on social media everywhere. So <laughs> I feel very trendy having thought up this discussion today about, uh, about the maritime, the main <laughs> naval domain. And um, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's uh, uh, an important discussion, not just because maritime issues are trendy on social media, but because they are uh, an extremely um, vital and, and crucial national security concern, specifically maritime gray zone threats. And that's what we will be discussing today, more specifically, um, Vice Admiral Andrew Lewis and Rear Admiral Eva Skoghausen will be discussing and I will be enjoying it along with you. And by the way, please feel free to, to think of questions uh, during the first half of the hour where, where I get the privilege of speaking to the two admirals so that we can, <clears throat> so that we can get the questions, uh, as many questions as possible into the Q&A portion during the second half of the hour. Now, um, Vice Admiral Lewis, uh, I, I have read up on his biography, so, I'm, uh, so I can recite it without having to check my notes. Uh, is a <laughs> naval aviator uh, by background and has, uh, among his many other accomplishments, uh, five more than 5,300 5, flying hours to his name uh, and lots of, of operations and missions, and uh, more than 1,100 arrested landings. How many in this room or on this call have? Uh, 1,100 arrested landings to their name. I think you are the only one, Admiral. Now, uh, Rear Admiral Eva skog um, is uh, 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 the chief of the Swedish Navy. And I should mention that, of course, uh, Vice Admiral Lewis was appointed to his current post as commander of the Second Fleet and uh, commander of the Joint Force Command Norfolk in 2018. Uh, and Rear Admiral uh, Skog Haslund was appointed in 2019 to her post as chief of the Swedish Navy, which of course includes a long coastline in, in everybody's favorite body of water, the Baltic Sea, which it may be a small body of water in comparison with, with certain other oceans, but it is a, a very busy one. Uh, prior to that, among her many uh, interesting assignments was her role as commander of the fourth naval warfare flotilla, where uh, as you may all know, but I'll repeat it just in case there is anybody who doesn't know, she commanded the 2014 submarine hunt uh, or the hunt for a suspected Russian submarine in the Swedish archipelago. If there's anybody here who hasn't tried to, to hunt for a, a submarine, uh, I think Eva can uh, tell you about the incredible complexity. And uh, I think uh, deep down, we all want to have hunted uh, submarines at some point after having watched the hunt for Red October. Alas, it's uh, only given to the fewest of us and, and Admiral Eva is one of the ones uh, who have done it. So with this, I'd um, like to turn to, to the subject today, which is maritime gray zone threats. And, and they come in, in all shapes and, and, and forms. And the problem is that uh, they are unpredictable. We have seen anything from, from the Iranian um, takeover of the Stena Impero um, uh, cargo ship a couple of years ago to um, movements around uh, undersea cables. Uh, there are around 300 of them, which as we all know, transport the world's uh, complete internet traffic. So are extremely vital to our well-being. Um, and uh, there can also be things, and there have been things like harassment of civilian crews um, building pipelines. And that can of course be disruption of of uh, shipping and as we all know and as, as people in the UK are uh, painfully experiencing we are dependent on global shipping 90% of the world's trade measured in volume travels by sea. So starting with you Admiral Lewis, uh, where, uh, where is the world when it comes to 
to maritime grazing threats, which developments have you been observing and, and uh, what, what should we as, as, as ordinary citizens uh, who depend on, on maritime uh, affairs and, and uh, the world's oceans functioning with as little as disruption as possible, what should we be concerned about? You have to get my game. Oh, hi. Um, yeah, so that's a good, a good question. So if you, if you can there's the acronym of SLOC, who is the sea lines of communication. I would refer to it more as the strategic lines of communication. And the, and the, the way that we consider that in the Atlantic, for example, is from seabed to space, Florida to Finnmark. And you know, if you can you you talked about 90% of the, the world's trade on the oceans, that's true. Uh, closer to hundred percent of the world's information flows on the seabed in conjunction with satellites. And that is something that is a gray zone area, which you referenced in the in the nefarious activity that the Russians and others, but certainly the Russians uh, have been focused on in, 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 in the undersea. And that's a, the undersea is very, is not transparent. And so it lends itself to hybrid activity where it's difficult to um, point fingers, if you like, in, the, in, that, in that world and, and, and a, you know, where you can, you can come up with a, a story, a messaging that is uh, perfectly um, legitimate where it's illegitimate in reality. Uh, so that's kind of the, how I would look at hybrid warfare writ large in the maritime. And then, you know, that that is not just the Atlantic, it's the Pacific up through the Arctic and the Arctic is becoming more and more of a competitive space as, as I know you're interested in talking about as well. But, and then, and then the activity on the sea and above the sea, the, the, the classic activity. You know, there's a, there's a maritime uh, code in which you operate in international waters and international airspace in which we have a, a professional code that we adhere to. And uh, all of our, uh, the entire alliance, all of our partners outside of the alliance and within NATO, and uh, all of our worldwide partners adhere to that same code. At times, um, other nation states will not adhere to that code. And, and along hybrid lines, what will not adhere to that code? The Russians, the Chinese, uh, terrorist groups, um, little green men on the on the on the uh, surface of the ocean, if you like. But uh, that that's where we're really focused, and and it's it's getting busier and busier. The str strategic lines of communication, we have to assure those, ensure and assure those strategic lines of communication. Thank you very much. Um, over to you, uh, Rear Admiral School Hasloom, and, and you have a, a very intense experience with, with precisely these sort of activities. So if you could tell us maybe from uh, your area, of, of, or your geographical area of activity, what, what, uh, what you've seen and, and what we as, as ordinary citizens should be concerned about. Yeah, thank you very much, and thank you very much for introduction and uh, invitation to this uh, interview. But uh, and discussion, um, I, I totally agree, of course, with with the vice admiral. Uh, I mean, it is uh, the international code which we most of us uh, apply to. Uh, that is uh, something that we are really keen on uh, to to protect as well. But of course, the adversaries, they don't, don't uh, apply to, to that code as, as in the same manner. And that is a part of the uh, hybrid uh, threat that we actually have. And, and it is also the national security code, which you were talking about. It, it's also it, it concern, sorry. It's also an international uh, security concern. 
to have all these, for example, the merchant shipping ongoing, and we would like to protect them as well. It is a busy sea, which we have in, in the Baltic Sea, of course, uh, and in our West Coast. Uh, it is a busy sea, which we are very keen to, to protect uh, and to keep safe uh, and to have that safe, safe route as well. The, the, the threat we have uh, against that one is that it's very easy to, to uh, hamper or harass without anyone uh, sees it and knows it. That is maybe the, the worst problem if you compare what can happen ashore. Uh, the surveillance, that, that's why we are very much concerned of always be present at sea, because then we can be the eyes uh, at sea and we can also both show our flag, of course, to other nations, but also to show that we are ready to protect the merchant shipping if that is the one that are being harassed. But the sea lines of communication, which uh, Admiral Lewis are talking about, that is very much an international and national concern to have those safe routes. And, and uh, that's something where I think uh, we are all wondering how this is supposed to work because uh, the sea lines, as, uh, uh, as, as uh, one of you said, and, and merchant shipping, it's, it's all over uh, the world's oceans and, and, and other bodies of water. And not even the US Navy is big enough to be everywhere. And as you said, uh, Admiral School Custom, it's not, it's, you need to see everything, but you can't be everywhere. So, so how does that work? How can uh, allies working together uh, find a way to, to provide the maximum protection uh, maybe starting with, with you, Admiral Lewis. Okay, yeah, thanks, Elizabeth. The, you know, the, uh, uh, not, the U.S. Navy alone can't do anything, frankly. And, uh, and you know, Ava, Ava mentioned um, uh, presence. And the way, the way we look at this, the way I look at it is, is, in accordance, there's professionalism, so professional behavior at sea in accordance with international norms, presence uh, throughout the world's oceans, uh, into the Arctic, wherever, wherever that we're talking about, and protection of these, uh, in this case, sea lines of communication. And the, the third P in that, in that, that phrase is partnerships. And those partnerships are absolutely critical. One of, the, one of the many things that I've learned, but probably the most uh, powerful thing that I've learned in this job, establishing a Joint Force Command Norfolk and reestablishing the US Second Fleet is the value of the partnerships that we have uh, and the value of, uh, of whether they're an alliance nation or they're uh, an a, a nation that's not a full alliance member, but is a partner of the alliance or any other partners, uh, whether they be military partners or non-military partners, we have to work together to maintain freedom of the seas, to be, be able to maintain that, that those trade routes over the globe, globe surface. And if you, look at this from a historical standpoint, you know, that more and more of the world's trade is on the oceans. More and more of the world is wealthier now than they've ever been before. More of the world is safer and healthier than they've ever been before. You know, in spite of what we're going through right now, it's much, much healthier environment globe than we've ever lived in. And that's because of partnerships that stem from the alliance in maintaining that safety. And that and the part of that maintaining that safe and deterring from global conflict. That is really the you know the bottom line of what we're looking at. But that the, we cannot, we have we have so much to learn from our partners. I mean, I I spent a couple of days out on the water in the in the, in the archipelago in Sweden a year and a half ago. 
and with Ava's predecessor and uh, learned more than I ever thought I would learn about mine countermeasures, about anti-submarine warfare, about operating in a, in a very restricted water space. That's very tactical lessons, but, but all these things that we can learn uh, from one another are, are tremendous. And, and you know, the, the, the most powerful part of any command starts with the trust in the relationships that you build with your partners. And imagine what you'll be able to, to learn now from Admiral Eva, now that, that the two of you are overlapping and uh, considering uh, her experience with anti-submarine warfare. Uh, but but um, Admiral Eva, I wanted to ask you, uh, so Sweden has a long coastline, uh, lots of um, activity that may not be uh, of the traditional, so uh, what you would consider uh, so a military aggressive, militarily aggressive kind, but but not uh, not the kind that, that can be ignored either. How do you, uh, with this long coastline and and um, such threats, and even though your navy navy is larger than it used to be, still it can't be everywhere. How do you how do you maximize your presence, and how do you uh, uh, create maximum? Uh, deterrence uh, and at, at, at the same time how do you protect as many as much civilian shipping as possible considering that not every uh, every cargo ship can be escorted or not even every second no exactly it's it's uh, we, we are quite busy as well we need to think this as a total defense um, task to, to solve because it's not only the military force that can provide the security. Uh, in Sweden we are now rebuilding the total defense. We are looking at the civilian authorities together with the military armed forces and we are together building a new kind of defense that, that really includes the whole society. Because all the agencies we have, the civilian agencies and organizations and everything, we need to work together. I think one question to, to really solve is the information flow and trustworthy information, both together with international partners, of course, but also national wise as well. Because the, 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 the organization that owns the trustworthy information, that is really a powerful uh, 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 thing to have. The, the, the information, the, the trustworthy and the truth information about it, because I think that is why how we are going to be, maybe um, someone will, will uh, try to, to have us in, in another direction or, or anything. I think the information that we can trust is really a key issue to, to work together. And of course, we are sharing information already today and both with international partners, partners, but also the national wise as well. And that is something that we really have to build further on uh, to, to, uh, to have a uh, society that is robust and to keep, keep our merchant shipping, for example, and, but also our own shipping as safe as, as we can and to maintain the freedom of the seas that, that, that the, uh, Andrew was uh, talking about. Um, also about the readiness. We have to uh, both being present, at, at a, as I said before, but also to have the high readiness and always thinking about what if. So we will have to start think different scenarios, which we are maybe not normal, no, that no, not normal scenarios for us, uh, military uh, uh, organizations to think about, but the, to think about different uh, unnormal uh, scenarios, uh, which we can find out together with the civilian agencies as well. For, for example, all, all the digital, we are more and more dependent of the digital information. And how if the digital information either was wrong, uh, manip manipulated to us, or if we can't have it, how can we then solve our tasks e even, even further on. So I think thinking about what if all the time and be prepared to that one and have a, a, a robust readiness, that will make us even more uh, stable and, and robust. 
Uh, that's an excellent point. And, and uh, as since you mentioned the, the role of the public, uh, I was reminded of, of the 1981 uh, Whiskey on the Rocks incident. And, and those who may not remember it, uh, feel free to Google it after the event. Um, uh, it, it was the, the Soviet submarine that, that ran uh, aground off the coast of Sweden. And, and uh, it was spotted by a member of the public, which I think uh, it, it speaks uh, so much or says so much about the role the public can play, considering that there can't be uh, members of the Navy in every single uh, part of every single body of water, but it was spotted by, the mem by a member of the public. And, and sort of I, building on that, I want to ask uh, you and, and building on, on what you said also, Admiral Leva, uh, what is uh, the role of, of uh, your civilian partners? In other words, civilian shipping companies, even members of the public in in creating that readiness, and and that's sort of goes from from maybe um, keeping a, a trained eye on on uh, things that don't look right, uh, all the way to celestial navigation and 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 knowing what to do in case uh, of of um, uh, GPS jamming or or, or rather these GPS um, distortion uh, that may send you to to the wrong destination. All of that affects obviously not just navies, but, but merchant shipping as well. So maybe starting with you, Admiral Lewis, uh, how can uh, the civilian sector, or including us ordinary civilians, become a, play, a, play a bigger role? Or a, and what should that role be? Yeah, I think that's, that's a really another good, uh, good question. <laughs> I, was, I was chuckling when, you know, I was just getting in the Navy when Whiskey on the Rocks occurred. So I'm pretty sure you weren't, you weren't uh, in your current role at that point. <laughs> and I know Ava wasn't either, but, but uh, you know, that, the, you know, when your, your description of that, of that, um, there's a couple things to think about. And, you know, and in the, in the, 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 the connotation of total defense uh, that that, uh, that Sweden thinks about that um, and other of the, you know some others in the Scandinavian countries that think about pretty um, you know it's it it is a that's a big shift from where we've allowed ourselves to be over the last number of years we've kind of gone away from that you know things like you know I would call coast watchers people that understand how celestial navigation works. I grew up with a, a, a guy that he's a merchant seaman in the United States now. He's, he, he actually runs a, 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 a dredge ship up in uh, the Pacific North, Northwest. And it, his hobby when we were kids was celestial navigation. We used to sit out in the back, back garden and look at uh, look at the stars, and he would explain them. This was when I was you know 15 or 16 years old. I didn't know the first thing about it. And then I, you know, my last job before I was here, I lived at the Naval Observatory in Washington D.C., which is uh, you know it's a fascinating education. The point is, we have lost a lot of that, not just in our uh, military, but in our society writ large. That that uh, you know I, that seagoing nation. And that's something that we can really, once again, take away from our partners, because that is something that is not quite as lost in Sweden or in Norway. They are, they can, they are very much maritime nations and still singing sea shanties all the time. Uh, the, you know, the, and then the point about when, when we lose global positioning or we lose... Uh, exquisite communications gear, or what are, you know, satellite communications, where as we see in the higher latitudes, that's very difficult to, uh, to maintain. Uh, we, even when we lose line of sight, electronic communications or digital capability, it goes back to a visual world, a world in which we, we need to rely upon our, our senses of our eyes and our ears and, and our, and our you know, our five senses there and, and to do the, the things that we need to do. And more and more as the electromagnetic spectrum is infringed upon and, and uh, manipulated by uh, you know, nefarious actors, the more we have to be able to rely upon those, uh, what I would call mission orders, 
the way to operate tactically, operationally, and strategically mm -hmm. on intent, where you have mm -hmm. very um, young operators, young civilians uh, who understand what they're seeing and know how to report it and know how to how to uh, defend themselves, if you like. That's something that I think we, we all could uh, educate our entire societies on now, on, on, the, mm -hmm. on the, the threat that exists, an existential threat to our way of life. Uh, that, that is what I think we, we owe to a, uh, our entire societies is understanding what all this means and what it means to the threat of our way of life, our families, uh, and our and our livelihood uh, that well, that is more at risk uh, than we care to admit. Cyber attacks, for example, what what little is known about that is very uh, is scary. How little of, is known about that? It's scary about. Uh, how little people know about what they're seeing on the horizon. So just as an example, um, but there's a lot, a lot there that, 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 that uh, both of you have brought up, which I, I think is really interesting. Admiral Eva, over to you. And there are lots of questions coming in and, and a reminder to everybody, if, you, if you'd like to have your question included, uh, now is a good time to send them um, because as, as we all know, um, uh, as a certain East German leader said, if you come too, li too late, uh, life will punish you. So if you post your question too late, it may not be included. But Admiral Leva, I, I wanted to ask you, uh, obviously Sweden is, is rebuilding total defense now, which was a, a sort of crown jewel during the, the Cold War with, with large parts of society involved in, in keeping the country safe in, in military and, and non-military roles. Um, including knowing what to do in a crisis and even in fact uh, knowing that it's a good idea to maybe let the authorities know if you spot something strange in the archipelago. So uh, I want to ask what role do you can, can the, uh, the uh, wider society and in particular um, the merchant shipping sector play to, to uh, support the Navy? I'm not saying that they have to necessarily have to support the Navy, but it's in their interest to do so, to, to keep their own activities safe. Mm. Yeah, exactly. We, we come from a, a situation uh, so many years ago, which we have decreased our military capacity in Sweden, but now we are increasing the capacity once again. And we are, we, we are dependent on the civilian society to, to, be, to be strong and to have the endurance to operate, of course. I think the reinforced uh, conscription, which we reinforced uh, two years ago, three years ago, I think that is, that is helping us to, to build a strong society. So even those people that are in conscription service during nine, 11 months, uh, even though they don't stay in the armed forces, they will, provide more security in the society as a whole, because the, the, uh, the knowledge about security situation and security issues, they, they can provide that to, to the civilian society. But of course, we are dependent of each other. And uh, we have seen that in the pandemic situation we are in right now, that we in the armed forces, we are helping the, the civilian agencies, for example, to, to make them more even robust. But in, in a situation which we will have like the, the, the war situation in Sweden, we are so dependent on the civilian society and of course that the sea lines that they still work because that is how we are provided uh, materials, food and everything to Sweden. So we are dependent on the, the sea lines uh, into Sweden. And not only Sweden, I, I must say that all the, the Baltic Sea countries, the, the, the Baltic countries, they are dependent of the sea lines as well. So it's not only for our own sake, we need to provide security to the sea lines. It's for, for all the other states in the Baltic Sea. And I think we need to cooperate even, even more together with other agencies that maritime domain, for example, the, the coastal guard and everything, 
but also with the merchant shipping with, with the um, with the business uh, we need to cooperate even more and we need to to train that one we don't have that much uh, swedish uh, merchant vessels any longer it's about 100 of them so the most uh, vessels trafficking Baltic Sea is international ones. And we need to cooperate together with those companies as well. Uh, you raise a fantastic point there, which is the, the globalization of merchant shipping and, and the fact that uh, most companies and indeed vessels uh, are not registered in, 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 uh, in our countries uh, in the West, but, but uh, in, uh, in other countries. Uh, that um, maybe can be identified another time. Um, I, I want to ask you one more question and, because my time to ask you questions, of, for me to ask you questions is, is running out. And it's about uh, the high north and, and the Arctic uh, where you both, uh, uh, and that, which you both keep a, keep a keen eye on. And so uh, maybe starting with, with you, Admiral Lewis, again, um, it, it, it is the classic gray zone scenario that I know uh, obvious um, uh, violations violations of, of, of any um, any rules happening, but but it's um, it's 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 always a little bit uncertain what exactly is happening, and and uh, both China and Russia are, as we all know, building out their presence, expanding their presence, and it's a, it's I think it's a. Uh, maybe not the best parallel, but it's a useful parallel to think about the South China Sea and, and China's construction of those artificial islands, which at any given point, it wasn't a, no step in, in that construction was, was a big deal or was a big enough deal for any sort of major response. But in accumulation, it was a, a quite, a, it was a quite decisive step and, and changed the, the uh, strategic reality there. So starting with you, Admiral Lewis, uh, on the high north and, and the Arctic. Okay, in the, in the high north, I mean, your, your, uh, the parallel uh, between uh, the South China Sea and, and the Arctic, I know a little bit on a different time scale and the environment, the environment in which operating there is obviously drastically different. Uh, but what the Russians are doing in the high north, and they're, they're an Arctic nation and fully with it, and they're the most populous Arctic nation, without a doubt. Uh, they have actual cities above the Arctic Circle, whereas nobody else really does. Uh, and they have got uh, a considerable interest there. And so they're, that's certainly within their international rights to be there. However, what they're doing is, is in some cases reinvigorating their military capability uh, in the Arctic and the high north and uh, you know invigorating uh, and increasing it uh, to try to uh, make it a militarily contested zone. And that is not in the, in the common interest of of the other Arctic nations uh, and what we cannot allow to happen. And, the, and we cannot, but it will happen. I think we may have lost Admiral Lewis momentarily. So let's go uh, move on to you, uh, Admiral Skoltan. Unless, oh. but with our uh, with our military, did you, did you have me back? I think uh, you were, uh, there was a brief disruption. Uh, let's see, can, are you still there? Okay, let's I can hear you fine. Can you? We can't hear you very well at the moment. So maybe let's move on to Admiral School for the for this one, and then we'll come back to you for, for the next one. So Admiral Eva, over to you. Okay, thank you. Um, well, the, the, um, I must say that the high north and the Arctic, it is, um, it's not uh, our priority in our region, I must say. Um, it, is, um, it is interesting for us though. We are, uh, 
we are um, uh, concerned of that area, of course. And for the Navy's sake, I must say, the Swedish Navy, that is not the area which we are participating in uh, operations and so on. But we are, of course, keen to uh, exercise together with others in that area, of course. And I think we can uh, provide protection to that area in some other matters, just to stay in our closest region, uh, uh, closest to, to Sweden. But it is an area which will intense, uh, which will increase the um, interest, of course, since we have a new route coming up, and we can also see that different countries are are present there uh, already now, but I think that will increase as well. So it is an it is a region, it is an area in our closest region which we are monitoring. Of course, we are monitoring the situation and how it will how it will um, um, uh, continue to to uh, have further on. But we are not present that there as a navy uh, in the time. Excellent. So I'm um, uh, reading through the excellent questions that, and, uh, uh, of, of uh, covering a very wide range that have come in. So uh, um, be ready for, for some, uh, to, to cover the, the, the gamut here. So maybe let's start with, um, with you here, Admiral Lewis. Um, are there any questions from CENTCOM's international maritime constructs that can be applied to NATO? Iran is quite comfortable with um, IR, GCN and gray zone hybrid tactics. Russia seems aggressive at the lower end of the Baltic and Black Seas. We have standing task forces that deal strictly with naval functions, but we have few organizational concepts that help us protect the private sector and maritime infrastructure that we count on. I think it was um, a, a question posed as a, as a comment. So I will let you comment uh, on that. And then I, uh, I'll follow up with a question for you, uh, Admiral Scott Haslam. Okay, thanks, Elizabeth. And the, the, uh, the, the, I hope you can hear me still. Okay, good. Um, the, the question about, I think it was about, or a comment about would a, a CMF construct, a combined maritime force construct in the Atlantic uh, be something, like like exist in the Middle East, would that be applicable uh, in the Atlantic? And I think absolutely. In fact, uh, just last week, I took that proposal forward uh, in in my uh, in my Navy to start that process because I absolutely think there. And this is this is to to uh, bolster and and uh, rely upon our partners in the Atlantic, both military partners and civilian partners, uh, that in order to provide the safety uh, to the, the transiting merchant fleet. So it's, it's how we would execute a, a battle of the Atlantic now, uh, you know, we call it the fourth battle of the Atlantic, uh, but the, you know, how we would do that which is go ongoing now because it's on hybrid. It's a hybrid situation. It's something we've been looking at. Uh, we've been looking at very closely for a while, and uh, and something that we're absolutely pursuing. Uh, and it's it's more of a, a higher end capability uh, when when you're talking about a Russian threat uh, than than what uh, what we deal with with the IRGCN in the Middle East. But and then just. Very briefly, I, I don't know when I dropped off from on the on the Arctic piece, but uh, we've got to be we've got to be that is the next contested space, and we in in order to maintain a free and open Arctic and high north, we've got to be able we have to be present there. We have to be operating professionally, uh, and we have to do so with our partners which fortunately our partners, uh, the Arctic nations, all but one are true partners. And we know who that one is. It's great to have friends. Um, and on that note for 
Admiral Haslum, Skog Haslum, um, a question, how has the standup of the US Second Fleet and NATO Joint Forces Command Norfolk impacted the Swedish Navy and other European navies? And I guess you can answer the, the question about the Swedish Navy, uh, or you may feel empowered to speak for, for all European navies, but, but uh, the Swedish Navy in particular. Thank you. Um, I, I think we are, uh, as we said before, we are dependent of each other and we are dependent of exercising to get, together to, to be strong when it really is needed because we can't, we can't believe that we can be strong and robust when it's needed if we haven't exercised before. So we are, we are exercising together with others and we do that, of course, with, with, the, with the United States when it comes into the Baltic Sea, for example, we try to exercise as much as we can together. And um, we are in Sweden now trying to, in every step we take and every uh, material dis discussion about we have about procur procurement, for example, we are having the processes uh, that, that we can work together, but also the procurement situation that we're talking about today, zero connectivity. So we are not need, in, 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 we should not be in need to, to train before we can operate together. It is supposed to be a day zero connectivity. So we're going to connect the, the first day uh, as we meet. So we are dependent of exercising together and we do that uh, also, but we can of course increase that uh, exercise um, uh, schematic, of course the, the schedule uh, even more. But we are in a need to do that together because we are building our security situation and national security situation in Sweden. We are building that one up on um, uh, working together with other nations. And we are relying on other nations to build that security situation for us. And I think that the, the point that uh, friends or allies uh, are not just uh, the members of, of uh, particular, particular alliances, I, I think is demonstrated in, in, in this event um, and uh, through the close cooperation between um, uh, the two admirals. So, um, uh, it goes beyond NATO and indeed um, uh, other alliances as well. And that is the, the, the fantastic advantage, ad, advantage that, that uh, a number of Western countries have. Um, every ally is an asset. Um, here is, a, a, I think, a, something that may be a, a tricky question, but I'll put it to both of you. Is the reliance of much of the merchant marine on low cost seafarers from countries under threat from Chinese foreign policy initiatives, a fragility and risk factor for many trading nations. Um, is either of you keen to tackle that one? Uh, I, I'll, I'll, I'll take a, a swag at it, I guess, but because the, the, uh, the world's merchant, uh, merchant force, if you like, has changed a lot over the last 30 or 40 years. Um, and, you know, that it's unionized, uh, whereas in the past it was not unionized. Uh, many of the, the uh, lower deck seamen are from uh, poor nations. And the masters of these, as you highlighted earlier, many of the ships masters uh, are where they used to be, they, the the vessel used to be registered and insured in uh, in Western nations are uh, less so uh, nowadays, and the masters are uh, more and more from Eastern European nations or non non Western uh, nations, and so the force looks a lot different, and the force is at risk, and the and the and the masters are are financially responsible and responsible for the safety of their crews and their cargo. And so what it means to those that of us that are entrusted with the protection of that, that fleet is, it, is it, 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 
there, we have to be, um, it, it does present an opportunity to adversaries, uh, to, to be frank, and we have to be a, a, attuned to that and make sure th that we are operating professionally and co uh, coordinating and, and, and um, assisting uh, the merchant fleet uh, accordingly. Where we've seen this a lot is uh, once you get down in the Middle East or in the Gulf of Guinea with uh, with piracy operations and the where the, uh, or counter piracy or anti piracy operations, where we have found the most benefit at sea is where we've had a strong partnership with with the with civilian. Um, uh, merchant fleets. And you know, we've seen a number of cases of that working well. Uh, and then I would just uh, add on the, the last question uh, as we're, we're talking through that, is, uh, you know, if you think about, uh, uh, you know, everybody was talking about exercising with, uh, with you know, partners and, and, uh, and being, uh, being able uh, to do so and what that brings to the alliance and partnership. What, you know, I would say the question was about, you know, what second fleet being reestablished means to Europeans or Sweden specifically. Well, I would flip that on its head and say, second fleet would not be where it is as a command now without Sweden and other partners in our, in our, in our uh, command network. Absolutely would not be. Uh, and that is, uh, and I'm for extremely grateful for uh, the nations that we are have, the nations and the organizations that we have partnered with and got assistance from, to include U.S., the U.S. Sixth Fleet uh, as well, and the U.S. Fourth Fleet down in Mayport, Florida. So the that's that's the way I look at it as the commander of of this this organization. I could not have, we could not have achieved even a fraction of what we did and over the last two years uh, without the partnership of, of Sweden and others. Uh, you know, when we did ball tops in 2019, I had about 50 staff members attached to fifth, uh, second fleet in total working for me during that task as the task force commander. I had about 450 on board the the Mount Whitney, many of you know, as well as the tactical forces, and those all came from other countries uh, and a U.S. exercise. Um, yeah, the, the power of friends, and and uh, I think the the, the Stena and Pero case really demonstrates what, what you said, Admiral, about um, about the the. Uh, mixed uh, setup of, of uh, the merchant marine, uh, as I recall, it, well, it's, it's a, it was a Swedish owned vessel, but uh, registered somewhere else and with a, a truly multinational crew that I think was mostly Indian, but with a, a Latvian on it as well. And, uh, but it, it, it fell on, uh, uh, on Western navies to somehow take a position and, and, and try to help. Uh, and one could say, uh, well, what is, what is Western Navy's obligation to, to this one uh, ship that is, is really not, uh, has very tenuous links to, to any Western country, but still because it carries uh, goods that, that we as, as ordinary citizens are dependent on. Uh, it, it's uh, in this case and in many other cases, it, it's assumed that, that uh, a Western Navy uh, will try to help. Um, a question, um, here, uh, the North Sea, Skagerrak and Kattegat constitute a vital link between the Baltic Sea and the North Atlantic and are important. They are both, uh, they are, uh, they are both of interest to the US Navy and the Swedish Navy. What are your respective views on the role of this region regarding our strategic lines of communication today and into the future and what the implication, implications for naval and uh, naval operations in this part of the world? Uh, so maybe starting with you, uh, Admiral Skoghaslum. Well, the, no the North Sea is, of course, very much important for us. 
We have a very big harbor in the West Coast called uh, Gothenburg, that is the second largest city in Sweden, and which we will, uh, we, we are actually receiving most bits and pieces that comes to Sweden, comes into Gothenburg. And Gothenburg is even an uh, important uh, uh, harbor, even for Norway, for example. So that is a very much important harbor. But of course, we have several more uh, harbors in the West Coast, but even so that the Straits uh, towards the Danish Strait and Öresund, we are very much keen to, to keep open as well. Just as I said before, just to provide uh, uh, goods in, into into the Baltic Sea to the to the different countries around the Baltic Sea as well. But the North Sea, I think we are now we, we are having a, a new marine regiment in the West Coast. So we are retaking that one as well. We are growing, as I said, in, in the Swedish armed forces and for the Navy's sake, we are now rebuilding uh, the marine uh, capacity in the West Coast. So we will have uh, more uh, presence there uh, in, in the future, of course. So it is important and it is important together with others as well, both for, for I, I think, UK and Norway and Denmark, uh, but also for the, for the Baltic countries as well. Now, Mara Lewis, if, I, if we can get a quick answer from you on this, on this one, because we have a number of really interesting questions uh, left and nine minutes to go. <laughs> it's key terrain. <laughs> It's absolutely key terrain. It's, in, it's an imperative that we uh, can, can control it uh, in this maritime. And here uh, is a more fundamental question, maybe starting with, with you, uh, Admiral Lewis. Uh, what measures are taking place now to sort out the definition and parameters of the gray zone before we decide on rules of engagement? So uh, a, a fundamental question really, which I should have asked as, as the first one, but here uh, it is and over to you, Admiral. You know, that, that is a, uh, a, a, very, a very, very good question and very difficult to answer. But I would say that, uh, you know, one starting point is uh, if you read Russian uh, doctrine, you know, unclassified Russian doctrine. It kind of it kind of lays out parameters and what they think of it. And so, if you're if you're trying to uh, operate in kind, uh, where you know where the those parameters are laid out by them, that gives us the opportunity to understand where we need to be bolstered or where we need to be able to be. Have have an advantage with an adversary, and and the same goes true with, uh, you know, if you if you observe and read what the Chinese are doing as far as their Belt and Road Initiative or as far as their um, Polar Belt and Road Initiative, that is, uh, you know, examples of hybrid activity, and which uh, where we can define as closely as we can, where we can, we need to counter that. To define it too strictly would probably be a mistake uh, because that, that would, we, we would get it into way of uh, uh, restricting ourselves in our thought. But, so I think a continuing discussion and a conversation on how that, what that looks like. And I'll jump next, uh, straight to the next question to fit as many, uh, questions as possible. Uh, here somebody says, I would add, supporting what Ray Ardman Haslam said, that further than adopting a what if approach for new hybrid scenarios, we need to push a what, push for a what it will be approach. This would be possible through innovation and new tools based on AI and deep learning in support of maritime situational awareness. So uh, Admiral, is that something you agree with and, and uh, how could it be done? I, I realize it's a, sort of a fundamental question with, with six minutes to go, but uh, uh, maybe a, a, few, a, a few sound bites. Yeah, uh, the, the what if um, question is very interesting. And, and I must add to, to what, what uh, Andrew said before, because the gray zone, um, I think the adversary that really would like to fool us into to some kind of corner 
they they are trying to that we shouldn't um, uh, think of it. That I, I mean, it's so unknown scenario for us. So it is the problem is what we don't know. Uh, we are having uh, an a normal situation without knowing it. We think it's normal all the time because maybe you are pushing us so very slow and in that slow uh, motion, you don't recognize that you are really pushing into a kind of corner. So the, the reliable information, I must add that once again, it's so important for us that the information we get is reliable and you can trust it and you can build trust between different actors and partners and so on. So um, thinking about the what if situations, that is something I think that all normal people shall do every day, uh, e even, even as a person, as an individ uh, individual people can do that all the time uh, in a normal society as well. I mean, if you are commander in some kind of a section, branch, uh, squadron, everything, that you can think what if. What would I do if this occurs? How will I react? And if you are responsible for some kind of organization, I think that most people in that organization really believes in you and think that you are thinking the unthinkable. So that is the whole clue about the situation. That is, uh, they are trying to get us into a corner without us knowing that we are pushing, push that way. So that is a tricky, tricky situation we are in, and we have lots of information, and we have to sort that out, and we have to rely on and and be capable to analyze that information that we get. Uh, so true, and and of course, part of, of of any country's deterrence posture should be to to signal that we are able to to outthink our adversaries, and and that we are not just responding to whatever they think up in in. In, uh, uh, in uh, conventional uh, activities uh, um, uh, and in, in gray zone activities. And on that note, I uh, I'm, apologies to everybody who's asked questions that I wasn't able to include, but uh, maybe one last question for, for you, Admiral Lewis, since it ties uh, in with what Admiral Eva just said. Uh, what do you think the US Navy can learn from the Swedish Navy re regarding dealing with, with complex na naval areas such as the Baltic Sea, particularly concerning the many countries' access to the Baltic Sea and the amount of merchants, merchant ships passing through. I, I mentioned already uh, the undersea in a shallow environment is one from a tactical sense, absolutely, that we could learn. Uh, we have a tremendous amount to learn from in fact, uh, my counterpart in Naples, uh, uh, Gene Black, Vice Admiral Gene Black, is is doing some things. He's going to uh, take command of a NATO uh, mine camp managers group that operates in the Baltic, so as to learn some of those things. Also, really, the there's there's a big piece about uh, the total defense and how to work with the civilian population. Sweden, which is it is is a lot different in, than the culture that we have in the United States, and that's something that we can really take away from not just the mar maritime nature of the of the country, not just the the independent um, non alliance nature, but those those things how that how Sweden has uh, continued to uh, not only um, um, survive, I bet, I, but but to get better and better all the time, and become more and more relevant on the world stage. There's a lot of lot to be learned from that. Well, on that happy and, and collegial note, um, uh, thank you both, uh, Admiral Schoolcastle and Admiral Lewis, for for. Uh, providing this really extremely comprehensive view over uh, uh, this infuriatingly diffuse uh, threat picture. And, and I think that's, that what, that's what makes it so attractive to our adversaries that, that uh, they can think up, they are, over, they are, 
they think they are one step ahead because they can think up any activity and we respond and and uh, as you said Eva we have to uh, we have to change their equation and 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 uh, and ideally we should signal that, that we can uh, we can outthink them them and why we while we can't think uh, while we can't read their minds and figure out what they are going going to do next we can signal that what whatever they they uh, come up with will be prepared um, and uh, that involves maybe working with uh, civil society and uh, uh, I think for us as civilians, the first step is to cure the sea blindness that, that most of us suffer from. So I hope we have done some of that today. Thank you again um, to the two of you and thank you all for listening and see you soon. Thank you very much. And see you. Thank you.